16 by 9, the bigger picture. It's fast paced, sexy, and a TV hit. But now we're going to take you behind the scenes to see the real CSI. When the suspects entered, he confronted them and he was shot three times. Is this a sexy job? Because on TV it's very sexy. No. I would say it's not very sexy. That's all coming up on 16 by 9. Here's Mary Garofalo. Good evening and welcome to 16 by 9, the bigger picture. Fingerprints, blood splatters, and DNA analysis, all part of the fast-paced, sexy world of CSI. Life behind the yellow line is off limits to most, but not to 16 by 9. For three months, our Carolyn Jarvis followed three members of Vancouver's RCMP forensic team. And tonight, she's giving you a gritty inside look at the real CSI. Just before 2 a.m., and two armed men crash through a door. This could be a scene from your favorite primetime TV drama. But it's not. It's real life crime. While the men are breaking in, the victim barricades himself inside a bedroom in a suburban Vancouver home, then escapes out a window. Police arrive, and the men are still inside. They make a break for it, but police and dog teams take them down. It's mid-morning and Sergeant Lisa Devrinchuk arrives on scene. Bad guys are in trying to attack the safe. They're trying to get in that safe. They know the safe is there and they're trying to get in. Lisa's a nine-year veteran of the RCMP's forensic unit. Her job, find the clues, read the clues, and put it all together. This is him leaving, because he goes around and gets caught. In the yard, she finds gloves, zap straps, bear spray, balaclavas. It's, it's still steaming warm from someone uh, wearing it. Yeah. Farther away, a gun yeah. holster. So, you want this up? Yeah, just so I can see that there's magazines in there. Every item meticulously marked, photographed, cataloged. What was their intent when they came here? They're not coming for a social visit. Why are you coming to a strange person's house with these items on you? We're going to have to pick this up a notch. Okay. It's going to start washing things away. In the snow and rain, this is what life is really like inside the forensic unit. Slow paced, tedious, and incredibly detailed. Life behind the yellow line is off limits to most, but for three months, 16 by 9 was invited in, following three highly trained forensic officers, Sergeant Lisa Devrinchuk, Staff Sergeant Jim Hignall, Corporal Shauna McPherson. Forget the fast-paced glamour dreamed up on TV. Is this a sexy job? Because on TV it's very sexy. No. I would say it's not very sexy. Okay, so there's one here, more there, and then more there. We don't drive around fancy cars. We drive vans that are full of gear. We wear army boots. The Hollywood myth is fingerprint scans, face recognition, DNA matches, all happening within minutes, even seconds. It makes for a lot of raised expectations. Positive for blood. The issue of DNA came up and I was actually asked by a judge. Well, I saw on such and such a show that this was possible and... What'd you say to him? I said, well, sir, this is uh, not Hollywood. This is real life and uh, that's just not the way it is. How long does it really take to get DNA back? Sometimes it takes anywhere from a month to six months, sometimes more. We don't have fingerprints pop up on screens and flash match match or anything like that either. In reality, the one thing these officers do more than anything? Photograph. Photographs. A lot of photographs. A lot of it comes down to expertise and intuition. 
which is exactly what leads Lisa to examine the front door. To me, I'm almost wondering if they're shouldering it. Does something hit? Police believe the suspects were wearing gloves and balaclavas when they forced the door open. That means little chance of lifting fingerprints or DNA. But Lisa takes a closer look. And sure enough. On the glass of the door, there was a, a smudge, an impression that appeared when I put the powder to it that had the appearance of skin. I could see the, the impression of skin as well as hair that was in the pattern area. I came to a conclusion that it could be the eyepiece of a balaclava. Is that enough to get DNA off of it? There's a lot of potential for that to be successful, yes. Little by little, the case is building. Across town, another disturbing call. A 24-year-old man tied up and brutally beaten with a hammer. This time, Corporal Shauna McPherson is dispatched. Our victim is uh, zap-strapped, but when they take him out to the driveway, he runs. Okay. And he makes it out to the road, and one of our off-duty members, who's actually on his way home from work, sees him in the middle of the road. Okay. Shauna is briefed, then steps into the crime scene and scans the room. I'm just not noticing any blood anywhere. This occurred inside, not outside, right? That's what I understand. Head injuries tend to bleed quite a bit. If the victim was beaten on the head with a hammer, there should be a lot of blood. But Shauna can't see it. There's none. The only th thing that I could see that even looks remotely like blood was over there. She calls in bloodstain analyst, Staff Sergeant Jim Hignell. They call you the blood guy. The blood guy, yes. Okay, what are his injuries? Um, he's got a, a, a large gash on the back of his head that bled extensively. Yep. He's got a broken nose. He's missing a couple front teeth. He's got a split upper lip. Yep. He's got a broken arm and a broken hand. I, I figured there'd be more blood. Certainly uh, after examining that scene for a little bit, the reason for the absence of blood is readily available. What did you find? Cleanup. And Shauna finds what might have been used for that cleanup. Underneath, we've located what appears to be a pillow with uh, staining on it consistent with blood. Looks like it's been pushed under. There's some marks indicating some sliding. It was just a normal pillow you'd see on anybody's bed with a pillowcase on it saturated with blood. That's just not normal. On the walls, not much to see, unless you're the blood guy. These ones are pointed that way. These ones here are pointed that way. A couple of these are pointed that way. So that's bringing, that's bringing the blood source back into this direction. Each drop of blood, no matter how small, tells the story of this brutal assault. So it all points to a theory of the, the blood the blood source being in this area low when blows were struck. That's the theory, but the proof will be found in a place they call the blood room. Coming up on 16 by 9. When blood strikes a surface at 90 degrees, the resulting drop of blood will be circular. And that's what you see and here. That's circular. That's all coming up. Welcome back to 16 by 9, The Bigger Picture. They can read the story of a crime in a fingerprint. They can catch a crook from a drop of blood. And our cameras were with Vancouver's RCMP Forensic Unit, behind the scenes as they work to solve real crimes. Here again is our Carolyn Jarvis. If you're looking for banker's hours, this job isn't for you. Sergeant Lisa Devonchuk's shift has just ended when she gets another call. A man shot three times inside his house. Several men came crashing through uh, a window in his house, a, a glass door in his house. When the uh, suspects entered, he confronted them and he was shot three times. 
Two of the bullets uh, went through and through. One bullet was lodged in his leg. Uh, all three bullets were to his lower legs. The suspects bind him with duct tape, raid his safe, take cash and guns, and leave with a threat. Phone the police and we'll come back and kill you. It's Lisa's job to find clues to who fired the gun and made that threat. I'm going to document this scene as it was found by the police, as well as try to see what evidence we can get to find out who those people were that came through. So we're gonna be looking at the point of entry. This duct tape is obviously something that um, is involved. What appears to be a bullet holes in the couch, I'm hoping we'll be able to find a, a slug. Any evidence that might have a print on it is photographed and seized. The first bullet is easy to find, but another is missing. Lisa thinks she knows where it is. It's somewhere in this couch and it should be in very good condition because it's literally being softened. She cuts through the first layer of material. Next, the batting, then the foam. I wanted to find that slug. You're ripping the couch apart. I was ripping the couch apart. Where could that go? More than an hour later, still no sign of the bullet. That is some moldy kind of food. I was getting very frustrated um, because logically, it should have been right where we were cutting. However, it wasn't there. Finally, at 3 a.m. Hang on. In. In here, push on it. Okay, yep, yeah, don't move. Okay. Five hours later, the missing piece of evidence is found. Finding those two bullets in this scene, we know what else is around here, and uh, we're going to definitely be able to get more evidence tomorrow when we come back. Lisa's long day is finally over. But it's just beginning for Corporal Shauna McPherson. She's one of only three people in the country that can make this face recognizable. It's a very robust individual, and I think that's going to be very interesting from a three-dimensional reconstruction perspective. Yeah, yeah. The skull and jaw washed up on the coast of BC some 30 years ago. According to the coroner, they belong to a man, but little else is known. So Shauna gets to work rebuilding the face, hoping someone will recognize it. He, we believe, is, is a First Nations Caucasian mixed individual between the ages of 45 and 60. The only remains that were found uh, that I'm aware of were just the skull and mandible. Amazingly, that's enough. Shauna starts by laying down tissue depth markers. And that really means how fleshy he is. Exactly, yeah. In, in various portions, in various areas of the, of the skull mm -hmm. and the face. So I'll place the markers and then start to just build up from there. It's painstaking work, every move precise, every measurement exact. You want it to look as natural as possible? At first, the face looks almost robotic, but with each step, it quite literally begins to take shape. A rule of thumb, the, the length of the ears is about the same length as the nose. Kind of rule of thumb. Now, Shauna becomes an artist. A touch here, an adjustment there. And it doesn't look like much yet, but it, the suggestion is there. Every step takes hours, the entire process, several days. But gradually, this skull is transforming. I really feel obligated to do justice to the, to the reconstruction, to provide dignity to this individual, and uh, to do my best to see that if, if I can repatriate him to his family. And that's the ultimate goal. While Shauna rebuilds her case, bloodstain analyst Staff Sergeant Jib Hignell is about to reconstruct his the basement hammer attack. This is our blood room. His lab is like a giant shower where he can literally watch the blood fly and see where it ends up. So what we do is we throw blood around in here in, in experiments. Really? And we need to wash it. So that's why uh, it's a waterproof room. Jim recreates the hallway where he believes the 24-year-old man was attacked and reproduces the crime with a hammer and animal blood. And what we're looking for is the resulting drops of blood and where they go, where that pattern takes us. It only takes one strike to tell what he calls the blood story. What we're seeing here makes sense to me as this being pretty much the area where the victim would have been struck. The shape and distribution of these tiny drops reveal an astonishing amount of information. For instance, 
straight out from where this blood source was, you'll see that they're very round. When blood strikes a surface at 90 degrees, whether it's under force or whether it's just gravity going down, the resulting drop of blood will be circular. And that's what you see and here. that's circular. We've just proven that. The theory was is that somebody was struck near ground level. Does what has happened here support that? Absolutely. It could be the key piece of information needed. And when we come back, Jim is handed what could be the weapon. Coming up on 16 by 9. So now we're able to see detail in this area here that we couldn't see before. Oh, so you didn't even see that print a second ago. Yeah. That's all coming up. Welcome back to 16 by 9, the bigger picture. Long hours, painstaking work, and personal sacrifice. But when it all comes together, there's nothing but pride for the men and women who work behind the yellow line. Here's our Carolyn Jarvis. It is day two at Sergeant Lisa Devonchuk's shooting scene, and a possible motive becomes apparent. Oh, and there's another one back here too, so there's four rooms. In a shed behind the house, police say there's a marijuana grow up. He now has admitted that he was actively using his grow and that when the suspects came, they in fact stole all his product. So they came, they beat him with a bat, they shot him three times and stole all the dope? Yes. Lisa's search for evidence leads her to the basement. I was focusing on the bloody footprints. But they're incomplete. To see the whole picture, you need a keen eye and a unique chemical. So what amido black does, it's a dye stain that will react with the proteins that are in the blood that we see here on the floor. Our eyes can only see so much of these impressions. Look at that. After spraying several sections of the floor, four distinct shoe prints appear seemingly out of nowhere. So now we're able to see detail in this area here that we couldn't see before. Oh, there's a nice one that we didn't know about. Oh, so you didn't even see that print a second ago? Yeah. Proof that at least four different people were down here while the blood was still fresh. It corroborates the victim's story again, but it also gives us that evidence that if we can locate suspects, if we seize their shoes, my goal would be to try to match those shoes to the footprints that were left in the basement. But there is one more piece of evidence that could help prove who was inside this home. The duct tape used to tie the victim up. It's huge. I'm thinking there could be DNA from both the victim as well as the suspect, as well as fingerprints of the suspect when he put that tape onto the victim. At the lab, Lisa painstakingly pulls apart every inch of the tape and puts it into a chamber using, believe it or not, crazy glue. The glue is heated and vaporizes into a mist. It sticks to any moisture in the chamber, including fingerprints. An hour and a half later, the duct tape is removed, stained, okay, goggles on, and put under a specialized laser to see if anything's visible. First couple of pieces are inspected. We're striking out. Nothing on this one. And it's not looking good. This roll of tape is a bust. This roll of tape is a bust, unfortunately. You were there for a while. Yes, we were. It wasn't looking good. No, it wasn't. What were you thinking? I was thinking that it was uh, a case where we just didn't happen to have a suspect who touched the tape with his, his free hand. But on TV, Every piece that they examine, they find a fingerprint that's perfect, uh, a pristine, very identifiable, uh, no distortion to it. It just looks so easy. And in real life, that's very few and far between. Few and far between. But then Lisa decides to re-examine the very first piece of tape where she noticed a fraction of a print. I found enough ridges and enough characteristics that I felt that that fingerprint would be identifiable. Huge. Yes, yes. I'm looking at this area right here. It's a partial print, but it could just be enough. So Lisa sends it to the fingerprint database, hoping there is a match. Back at her 
Lab Corporal Shauna McPherson is also hoping to find a match for her unidentified man. Is there attachment to him now? I mean, you, know, you spent a lot of time. I have a bit of a, bit of a relationship, yeah. I've, um, I've, you know, when I carry him back to my locker at night, I, I feel very attached to this individual. After four days of painstaking work, she's putting the finishing touches on, drooping the skin slightly, adding wrinkles, and using sandpaper to recreate the aging process. I do chat with him when I'm sculpting here alone at night. So. Do you really? I, oh, just a little, you know, I'll say, okay, what do you think of that? You know, it's kind of silly, but yeah. You, you kind of develop a little bit of a bond with the cases that you work on. After a few attempts with various looks, this is the image that will be released to the public. A man with no name who hopefully someone will recognize. It's really sad to me to think that somebody can be gone for 30 years and we don't know where he came from. And perhaps he did have a small family, but to be able to return him to even that one individual who's got the question out there, at least it answers that question. And it gives him a dignified end as well, rather than sitting on a shelf in a government office somewhere. You know. Some cases take 30 years for closure. Others, like Staff Sergeant Jim Hignall's, are far quicker. A hammer recovered from the crime scene reveals more blood and is sent to the lab for DNA analysis. Only a week and a half after Jim was called to the scene, two suspects, Dustin Bratton and Lonnie Fisher, are charged with assault with a weapon, aggravated assault, and unlawful confinement. Five months later, a third suspect is picked up on a province-wide warrant and charged with the same three crimes. Now it's up to the courts to decide if the allegations are true, but Jim has done his job. You take a moment and you realize that's why I do it. The rewards can be tremendous, but so are the sacrifices. Lives interrupted, events missed, and calls out in the middle of the night. Sometimes we're pulled away and we don't know how long we're going to be gone for. We could be there for hours or we may be at a scene for days. That's why phone calls like the one Sergeant Lisa Devonchuk received two days after she sent that fingerprint to the lab make it all worthwhile. What was the call? The call was uh, telling me that they got a name to that fingerprint. That name is Kenneth Chudley, charged with five crimes, including aggravated assault and unlawful confinement. His fate, too, now up to the courts. I've helped that man who's been shot. Uh, regardless of what type of lifestyle he had, he was shot. And I've helped brought justice to the people that did that to him, and it's very rewarding. This is no film noir. It's the daily grind for these officers. But ask any of them and they'll tell you that when it's a good day, it'll give any Hollywood ending a run for its money. And that's it for us tonight. If you have a story idea, just call us at 1-877-TELL-69 or visit our website at global16by9.com. I'm Mary Garofello. Thank you for watching. And from all of us here, good night. If you've got a story idea for 16 by 9, call our tip line 